Hey everyone! All right, we're going to start chapter six, the silver chair today. Chapter six: The Wild Waste Lands of the North. At about nine o'clock the next morning, three lonely figures might have been seen picking their way across the shribble by the shoals and stepping stones. It was a shallow, noisy stream, and even Jill was not wet above her knees when they reached the northern bank. About fifty yards ahead, the land rose up beginning of the moor, everywhere steeply and often in cliffs. I suppose that's our way, said Scrub, pointing left and west, where a stream flowed down from the moor through a shallow gorge. But the marsh wiggle shook his head. The giants mainly live along the side of that gorge, he said. You might say that the gorge was like a street to them. We better, we do better straight ahead, even though it's a bit steep. They found a place where they could scramble up, and in about ten minutes, they stood panting at the top. They cast a longing look back at the valley, at the valley land of Narnia, and then turned their faces to the north. The vast, lonely moor stretched on and up as far as they could see. On their left was rockier ground. Jill thought that it must be the edge of the giant's gorge and did not care about looking in that direction. They set out. It was a good, springy ground for walking and a day of pale winter sunlight. And as they got deeper into the moor, the loneliness increased. One could hear peewits and see the occasional hawk. And when they halted in the middle of the morning for a rest and a drink in the little hollow by a stream, Jill was beginning to feel that she might enjoy adventures after all, and said so. We haven't had any yet, said the Marsh Wiggles. Walks after the first halt, like school mornings after break or railway journeys after changing trains, never go on as they were before. When they set out, Jill noticed that the rocky edge of the gorge had drawn nearer, and the rocks were less flat, more upright than they had been. In fact, they were like little towers of rocks, and what funny shapes they were. I do believe, thought Jill, that the, all the stories about giants might have come from those funny rocks. If, if you were coming along here when it was half dark, you could easily think that those piles of rocks were giants. Look at that one now. Look at that one now. You could almost imagine that the lump on top was a head. It would be rather too big for the body, but it would do well enough for an ugly head, and all that bushy stuff, I suppose it's heather and bird's nests, really, would do quite well for hair and a beard, and the things sticking out on either side are quite like ears. They're horribly big, but then I dare say giants would have big ears like elephants, and... Oh! Uh, her blood froze. The thing moved. It was a real giant. There was no mistaking it. She had seen it turn its head. She had caught a glimpse of the real, stupid, puff-faced cheek. All of the things were giants, not rocks, and there were forty or fifty of them, all in a row, obviously standing with their feet on the bottom of the gorge and their elbows resting on the edge of the gorge, just as men might stand leaning on a wall, lazy men, on a fine morning after breakfast. Keep straight on, whispered Puddleglum, who had noticed them too. Don't look at them. Whatever you do, don't run. They'll all be after us in a moment. So they kept on pretending not to have seen the giants. It was like walking on past the gate of a house where there was a fierce dog, only worse. There were dozens and dozens of these giants, and they didn't look angry or kind or interested at all. There was no sign that they had even seen the travelers. And then whiz, 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 some heavy object came hurtling through the air with a crash. A big boulder fell about 20 paces ahead of them, and then thud, another fell 20 paces behind them. I should just take a moment. For those of you who haven't, who don't know this, um, the lady who drew these drawings, her name is, in the book, not the cover, the cover art is by Chris Van Ellsberg. Um, but the, 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 all the drawings in the book come from a lady named Pauline Baines. And she drew a lot, all C.S. Lewis's Narnia books and several other books from that time period. And she's great. Some of Tolkien's books, too, actually. Uh, she's great. Pauline Baines. Sorry. And then thud, another fell 20 feet behind. Are they aiming at us? Asked Scrub. No, said Puddleglum. We'd be a good deal safer if they were. They're trying to hit that. That rock over there. They won't hit it, you know. It's safe enough. They're such bad shots. 
They play this most fine mornings, and the only game, it's about the only game they're clever enough to understand. It was a horrible time. There was no end to the line of giants, and, giants, and they never ceased hurling stones, some of which fell extremely close. Quite apart from the real danger, the very sight and sound of their faces and voices were enough to scare anyone. Jill tried not to look at them. After about 25 minutes, the giants appeared to have a quarrel. This put an end to the game, but it is not pleasant to be within a mile of quarreling giants. They stormed and jeered at one another in long, meaningless words of about 20 syllables each. They foamed and gibbered and jumped in their rage, and, they, and each jump shook the earth like a bomb. They lammed each other on the head with great clumsy stone hammers, but their skulls were so hard that the hammers bounced off again, and the, then the monsters who had given the blow would drop the how, hammer and howl with pain because it had stung their fingers. But it was... But he was so stupid that he would do exactly the same thing a minute later. It, this was a good thing in the long run, for by the end of an hour all the giants were so hurt that they sat down and began to cry. And when they sat down, their heads were below the edge of the gorge, so you saw them no more, but Joe could hear them howling and bl blubbering and boo-hooing like great babies even after the place was a mile behind. That night, they camped on the bare moor, and Puddleglum showed the children how to make the best of their blankets by sleeping back to back. The backs keep each other warm, and you can then have both blankets on top. But it was chilly even so, and the ground was hard and lumpy. The marsh wiggle told them that they would feel more comfortable if only they thought of how very much colder it would be later on and further north. But this didn't cheer them up much at all. They traveled across Edens Moor for, for many days, saving the bacon and living chiefly on the moorfowl. They were not, of course, talking birds, which Eustace and the wiggle shot. Jill had rather envied Eustace for being able to shoot. He had learned it on his voyage with King Caspian. As there were countless streams on the moor, they were never short of water. Jill thought that when, in books, people live on what they shoot, it never tells you that the long, messy job it's plucking and cleaning birds and how cold it makes your fingers. But the great thing was they had, hard, they had met hardly any giants. One giant saw them, but he only roared with laughter and stumped away about his own business. About the tenth day, they reached a place where the country changed. They came to a northern edge of the moor and looked down at the long, steep slope into a different and grimmer land. At the bottom of the slope were cliffs. Beyond these, a country of high mountains, dark precipices, stony valleys, ravines so deep and narrow that one cannot see into them, and rivers that poured into echoing gorges to plunge su sullenly into black depths. Needless to say, it was Puddleglum who pointed out a sprinkling of snow on the more distant slopes. But there'll be more on the north side of them, I shouldn't wonder, he added. It took them some time to reach the foot of the slope, and when they did, they looked down from the top of the cliffs at the river running beneath them from west to east. And it was walled in by precipices on the far side as well as their own, and it was green and sunless and full of rapids and waterfalls. And the roar of it shook the earth where they stood. The bright side of it, said Puddleblum, that if we break our necks getting down the cliff, then we'll be safe from being drowned in the river. What? What about that? said Scrub, suddenly pointing upstream to their left. And then they all looked and they saw the last thing that they were expecting. A bridge. And what a bridge, too. It was a huge single arch that spanned the gorge from cliff top to cliff bottom, or cliff top to cliff top, and the crown of that arch was as high above the cliff tops as the dome of St. Paul's is above the street. Why, it must be a giant's bridge, said Jill. Oh, a sorcerer's, more likely, said Puddleglum. We've got to look out for enchantments in a place like this. I think it's a trap. I think it'll turn into mist and melt away just when we're in the middle of it. Oh, for goodness sake, don't be such a wet blanket, said Scrub. Why on earth shouldn't it be a proper bridge? Do you think any of the giants we've seen would have built a thing like that? But mightn't it have been built by other giants, said Jill? I mean, by giants who lived hundreds of years ago and were far cleverer than the modern kind. It might have been built by the same ones who built the giant city we're looking for. And that would mean that we're on the right track. An old bridge leading to the old city. That's a real brainwave, Pole, said Scrub. It must be that. Come on. And so they turned and went to the bridge, and when they reached it, it was certainly seemed solid enough. The single stones were as big as those at the Stonehenge and must have been squared by good masons once, although now they were cracked and crumbled. 
and the side of the bridge had apparently been covered with rich carvings, of which some traces remained, moldering faces and forms of giants, minotaurs, squids, centipedes, and dreadful gods. Puddleglum still didn't trust it, but he consented to cross with the children. The climb to the crown of the arch of the bridge was long and heavy. In many places, the great stones had dropped out, leaving horrible gaps through which you could look down and see the river foaming through thousands of feet below. They saw an eagle fly through under their feet. And the higher they went, the colder it grew and the wind blew so that they could hardly keep their footing and it seemed to shake the bridge. When they reached the top and they could look down the farther side of the bridge, they saw what looked like the remains of an ancient giant road stretching away before them into the heart of the mountain. Many stones of its pavement were missing and there were wide patches of grass between those that remained. And the riding toward them on that ancient road were two people of normal, grown-up, human size. Keep on, move toward them, said Puddleglum. Anyone you meet in a place like this is as likely as not to be an enemy, but we mustn't let them think we're afraid. By the time they had stepped off the end of the bridge under the grass, the two strangers were quite close. One was a knight in complete armor with his black visor down. His armor and horse were black, and there was no device on his shield, and a banner and no banner on his spear. The other was a lady on a white horse, a horse so lovely that you wanted to kiss its nose and give it a lump of sugar at once. But the lady who rode side saddle and wore a long fluttering dress of dazzling green was lovelier still. Good day, travelers, she called out in a voice as sweet as the sweetest bird song, trilling her R's delightfully. Trilling her R's. Let me try again. Good day, travelers. That's pretty rough. Good day, travelers. We're going to try that. Some of you are young pilgrims to walk in this rough waste. That's as may be, ma'am, said Puddleglum, very stiffly on his guard. We're looking for the ruined city of the giant, said Jill. The ruined city? I can't do... Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. The ruined city, said the lady. That is a strange place to be seeking. What will you do if you find We've got to... But Puddleglum interrupted. Begging your pardon, ma'am. But we don't know you or your friend. Silent chap, isn't he? And you don't know us. And we'd as soon as not talk to strangers about our business, if you don't mind. Shall we have a little rain soon, do you think? The lady laughed. The richest, most musical laugh you can imagine. You can imagine it. I'm not going to try that. <clears throat> the richest... Most musical laugh you can imagine. Well, children, she said, you have a wise, solemn old guide with you. I think none the worse of him for keeping his own counsel, but I'll be free with mine. I have often heard the name of the giant, the giantish, I have often heard the name of the giantish city ruinous, but I've never met anyone who wanted to go thither. This road leads through the burg and the castle of Harfane, where dwell the gentle giants. They are as mild, civil, prudent, and courteous as those of the Edithsmore are foolish, fierce, savage, and giving to all beastliness. And in Harfang, you may or may not hear tidings of the city ruinous, but certainly you shall find good lodging and merry hosts. You will be wise to winter there, or at the least to tarry certain days for your ease and refreshment. There you shall have steaming baths, soft beds, and bright hearts, and the roast, and the baked, and the sweet, and the strong will be on the table four times a day. I say, exclaimed Scrub, that's something. Think of sleeping in a bed again. Yes, and having a hot bath, said Jill. Do you think they'll ask us to stay? We don't know them, you see. Only tell them. Did I show you this picture? I can't remember. Sorry. Oh. I apologize. Will we be able to stay? Only tell them, answered the lady, that she of the green kirtle salutes them by you and has sent the two fair southern children for the autumn feast. Oh, thank you so very much, said Jill and Scrub. But have a care, said the lady, on whatever day you reach Harfang, that you come not to the door too late, for they shut their gates a few hours after noon it is the custom of the castle that they open to none once they have drawn the bolt. 
no matter how hard they knocked. The children thanked her again with shining eyes. The lady waved to them, and the Marsh Wiggle took off his steeple hat and bowed very stiffly. And then the silent knight and the lady started walking with their horses up the slope of the bridge with a great clatter of hoofs. Well, said the little boy, I'd give a good deal to know where she's coming from and where she's going. Not the sort to expect to meet in the wilds of giant land, is she? Up to no good, I'll be bound. Oh, rot, said Scrub. I thought she was simply super. I think of hot meals and warm rooms. Oh, I do hope Harfang isn't a long way off. Same here, said Jill. And hadn't she a scrumptious dress and the horse? All the same, said Puddlebun. I wish we knew a bit more about her. I was going to ask her all about herself, said Jill. But how could I when you wouldn't tell her anything about us? Yeah, said Scrub. And why were you so stiff and unpleasant? Didn't you like them? Them, said Puddlebun. Who's them? I only saw one. Didn't you see the knight? asked Jill. I saw a suit of armor, said Puddlebun. Why didn't he speak? I expect he was shy, said Jill. Or perhaps he just didn't want, he just wants to look at her and listen to her lovely voice. I'm sure, sure I would if I was him. I was wondering, remarked Puddlebun, what you really would see if you lift up the visor of that helmet and looked inside. Hang it all, said Scrub. Think of the shape of the armor. What could be inside except a man? How about a skeleton? Asked the Marsh Wiggle with ghastly cheerfulness. Or perhaps, he added as an afterthought, nothing at all. I mean, nothing you could see, someone invisible. Really, Puddlebum, said Joe with a shudder, you do have the most horrible ideas. How do you think of them? Oh, bother his ideas, said Scrub. He's always expecting the worst, and he's always wrong. Let's think about those gentle giants and get on to Harfang as quick as we can. I wish I knew how far it is. And now they nearly had the first of those quarrels, which Puddleblum had foretold. Not that Jill and Eustace had been smarring and snapping at each other a good deal before, but this is one of the first serious disagreements. Puddleblum didn't want to go to Harfang at all. He said that he didn't know what a giant's idea of being gentle might be, and anyway... Aslan signed and said nothing about staying with giants, gentle or otherwise. The children, on the other hand, who were sick of wind and rain and skinny fowl roasted over campfires and hard, cold earth to sleep on, were absolutely dead set to visit the gentle giants. In the end, Puddle Glum agreed to do so, but on one condition. The others must give an absolute promise that unless he gave them leave, they would not tell the gentle giants that they came from Narnia, but that they were looking for Prince Rillian. And they gave him this promise and went on. After that talk with the lady, things got worse in two different ways. In the first place, the country was much harder. The road led through the endless narrow valleys down through the cruel north wind was blowing in their faces, and there was nothing that could be done, and nothing could be used for firewood, and there was no little hollows to camp in, and they had, as there had been on the moor. And the ground was all stony, and made your feet sore by day, and every bit of you sore by night. And in the second place, whatever the lady had intended by telling them about Harfang, the actual effect of the children was a bad one. They could think about nothing but beds and baths and hot meals and how lovely it would be to get indoors. And they never talked about Aslan, or even about the Lost Prince now. And Jill gave up her habit of repeating the signs over to herself every night and morning. She said to herself at first that she was too tired, but she soon forgot all about it. And though you might have expected that the idea of having a good time at Harfang would have made them more cheerful, it really made them more sorry for themselves and more grumpy and snappy with each other and with Puddle Glum. At last they came one afternoon to a place where the gorge in which they were traveling widened out, and dark fir woods rose on either side, and they looked ahead and saw that they had come through the mountains. Before them lay a desolate, rocky plain, and beyond it further mountains capped with snow. But between them and those further mountains rose a low hill with an irregular, flattish top. Look, look, said Jill, pointing across the plain, and though, and there, through the gathering light, through the gathering dusk, from beyond the flat hill, everyone saw lights not mount not moonlight or fires but homely cheering row of lighted windows if you have ever been in the wild wilderness a day or night for weeks you will hardly understand how they felt harfang cried Scru scrub and jill in glad excited voices harfang 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 repeated puddle glum in a dull gloomy voice and he added hello wild geese 
and he had the bow off his shoulder in a second. He brought down a good fat goose, and it was far too late to think of reaching Harfang that day, but they had a hot meal and a fire, and started the night warmer more than they had been for over a week. After the fire got out, and the night grew bitterly cold, and when they rose the next morning, their blankets were stiff with frost. Never mind, said Jill, stamping her feet. Hot baths tonight. And that is the end of chapter six. Flying through, y'all. On page 94, not bad. The story's just starting to get good. See you later.